you, Dr. George. Um, I'm glad there's people still passionate about the microscope. I think if I found out about it and found a creature with a polished suit of sable armour, I probably would have just stopped and thought that would be the peak of my career and I wouldn't have taken it any further. Um, with uh, our next speaker, sorry, I just can't see past there. Our next speaker is Dr. Teresa McDonald. Teresa is an obstetrics and gynaecology registrar who is currently working on a PhD aimed at developing a blood test to identify babies that will be born small, as well as examining patterns of fetal growth and their impact on birth outcomes. These are both with the aim of reducing stillbirth. As well as her passion for obstetrics, a small part of Teresa wishes she was actually a musical theatre star instead of a doctor. And so she's quite excited to add her voice to the mathematics choir tonight. So please welcome Dr. Teresa MacDonald. Thank you very much. Tonight I'll be speaking about the history of the obstetric forceps and in the relationship to the theme of light, I'll be shining light on what is literally a very dark corner. <laughs> That's about it as it goes towards light though, I'll, except for the fact that I can't see any of you because of the lights that are on me. Basically, for those of you who don't know, but I'm sure most of you are aware, the obstetric forceps are sort of like a pair of large salad tongs that we slide so skillfully into a woman's vagina at the time of trying to deliver a baby to expedite that delivery and deliver the baby faster. Essentially, we sort of slide them on the baby's head like this <laughs> and then sort of pull the baby out. <laughs> Take it from me, it takes a lot of skill and technique. Essentially tonight I'm going to talk to you about the history of the obstetrics forceps because it's a great story and while it's not the most sciencey of topics, it is a huge medical advance which has saved so many lives of both babies and, and mothers in the time since they were developed. I'm going to break it down into four sections. One, life before forceps. Two, the Chamberlain family secret. Three, a little gem from a guy called William Smalley, just for humour's sake. And four, the rise and fall of conservative management of labour, but in the context of the 1700s. So what was life... <laughs> and that debate is still going on. <laughs> what was life like before the invention of forceps? Essentially, before the forceps were invented, midwifery was the opposite of science. There was essentially no actual interventions that actually helped anyone. <laughs> it was a series of primitive um, goals which consisted of folklore and superstition. There were some herbal potions and fumigations. If a, if a baby got stuck during the process of uh, labour after a woman, essentially it wouldn't be diagnosed that the, the labour was really obstructed until it had lasted a few days. And she'd be pushing and pushing and pushing. The baby would always die. And then if she still couldn't deliver the baby after the baby was, had died... Now, this is a little bit brutal. The only intervention that could be called upon was to use any sort of tools to decrease the size of the stillborn baby to enable her to pass it. And that was in a, a last attempt to save the mother's life. Now, these tools would be ranged from things like kitchen utensils uh, and some surgical instruments of the time. But as you can imagine, it's quite brutal. And unfortunately, despite those attempts, a lot of women would die anyway from sepsis and other related injuries. I'll just give you a quote from 11th century midwife Dame Trot, just to give you an idea of how primitive things were. When there is a difficult labour with a dead child, place the patient in a sheet held at the corners by four strong men with her head somewhat elevated. Have them shake the sheet vigorously by pulling on opposite corners and if, if it's God's will, she will give birth. Scientific, right? <laughs> this leads me to the Chamberlain family. The Chamberlain family are responsible for the first invention of the forceps. But it's such an amazing story because for them, it was, the, it was like this magic that they could bring to a sticky situation. So they kept it a secret for almost a century. William Chamberlain was the head of the Chamberlain family and he was a surgeon in France, a Huguenot surgeon. But in 1569, Catherine de Medici had banned Protestant physicians, so he migrated from Paris to England. Three years later, his first son, Peter, was born. He then had another son later in the family who he also called Peter. There must have been a shortage of names. I don't think anyone had uh, d developed baby name books or anything at that stage. So he called them Peter the Elder and Peter the Younger. 
<laughs> I'm Teresa the Elder, and if my mum could have had another daughter, I'm sure she would have called her Teresa the Younger. I don't know. Anyway, it's not entirely known which of the Chamberlains actually invented the, the forceps because they kept it a secret. They didn't document anything, and so all of the lab work that went into developing them is a secret. So I've got out of this whole science thing pretty scot-free. Um, but it is accepted that Peter the Elder probably designed the first model and that other members of the family possibly adjusted it as time went on. So they went to great lengths to keep this invention a secret. If a woman's labour was obstructed and their, their help was called upon, they would carry into the house a large gilded chest. They would make sure everyone left the room and then they would blindfold the woman as if it, being in labour for hours and hours on end and not being able to push your baby enough is, is not enough. It's like, I'm going to blindfold you and you are not going to be able to see anything. And then they'd cover her with a blanket just in case she could peek. And then they'd like ring some bells at the door in case anyone was listening. So no one knew what went on except that they would miraculously... <laughs> oh, that's great. They would miraculously deliver a baby, yay. So this really drastically changed things because it moved from being a way of delivering a stillborn baby to actually being used to deliver live babies for the first time as well. Now, Peter the Younger, he married twice. He really contributed to his family role in births by having 18 children, 13 with his first wife and five with his second. So he had three sons that, that um, continued in the Chamberlain tradition of practising man midwifery as it was at the time. So his eldest son, Hugh, was one of these sons, and he actually visited Paris in 1670 with the intention of finally selling the secret of the forceps, mainly just to raise some cash. He went, though, and while he was there, he was challenged by a French man midwife called Francois Morisot, who's quite famous in obstetric circles. Now, he was an accoucher of the day as well, and he said, oh, you think you're so good at delivering babies? I want you to deliver this dwarf. So this woman had suffered from severe rickets, had a completely deformed pelvis, had been in labour for eight days. He goes, go on, you deliver her. Then we'll see how good you are. Unfortunately, he couldn't, not surprisingly. And so he left Paris without selling the secret. He did, however, manage to get his hands on um, Francois Morisot's book, which was his, um, it was essentially his statements about managing labour and delivering babies. And he just translated it from French to English and then got really famous in England for that. <laughs> so he called it the accomplished midwife and it was such a great success that he became physician to King Charles II. Later on, he was accused of practising without a licence, so he had to leave England and went to, um, to the Netherlands and he was living, well, he visited a Dutch obstetrician and he was one of the people who later actually brought out some forceps in the early 1700s. So it's believed that Hugh possibly sold him in some instruments then. The actual original Chamberlain instruments were not discovered until 1813. They had been put into, under the floorboards of the attic in the Essex residence by Peter the Younger's wife, Anne. But the models of the forceps started to appear in the early 1700s and became used in, in general obstetric practice. So by the middle of the 1700s, many people were using the forceps, including a guy called William Smalley, who's another quite famous obstetrician in obstetric circles. He's the first person who kind of wrote the rules of, of how to apply the forceps and when you should and, and, and how to do it more safely. But I just want to let you know that he, he thought that the forceps should be lubricated with hog's lard to make it in insertion easier and to prevent transmission of venereal infection. That's right, let's put animal fat on things because bacteria won't grow in that. But they didn't know about bacteria yet. So use a condom, not hog's lard. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to talk about is the rise and fall of conservative management. So another obstetrician of the time was William Hunter, and he was appointed to the physician, um, as a physician to Queen Charlotte. He was really familiar with forceps, but he prided himself on never having to use it. So he was like the first man midwife or obstetrician to champion conservative management, and he was the first man midwife to actually get involved with normal birth rather than leaving it to the midwives as had been done in the past. So to work amongst normal deliveries. And he used to illustrate that point by carrying around a pair of rusty forceps to show how little he had to use them. 
Protestants. But then conservative practice sort of became sort of popular again until the story of Princess Charlotte. Now, Princess Charlotte was the daughter of King George IV, and she was 21 when she was pregnant with her first baby. She went into labour when she was two weeks overdue, so that's already a risk factor for obstructed labour people. Bigger baby, harder to push out. Her labours lasted 50 hours, and the baby was stillborn. The placenta was retained, it didn't deliver, and so they, they waited three hours before they did a uterine exploration to remove the placenta, and then she died secondary to a hemorrhage. Not only was it awful to lose a mother and a baby, but there was no heir to the throne. So this was a huge controversy of the day, and it was widely criticised that the obstetrician, Sir Richard Croft, had had forceps there, but had not used them. And so this was the fall of the conservative management of the 1700s. And unfortunately, uh, Sir Richard Croft couldn't take that sort of criticism and shot himself in both temples. So on that cheery note, I'll finish up. <laughs> I'd just like to say that it is quite incredible that this, in, this instrument, which was developed in the late, uh, the late fifth, well, the early 1600s, has, if you look at the design of the original Chamberlain forceps compared to what we use right now, they're very extremely similar. So whatever techniques they did use to design them, it is a testament to their ingenuity that, and their knowledge of the anatomy that they've managed to get it so right. And while at the start it was just used to deliver a baby so that when a woman couldn't push it out, we now use forceps for a variety of techniques. So not just for um, maternal mortality or, or fetal mortality, but we think about things like, is this baby getting enough oxygen? And we can deliver a baby earlier so that they're not handicapped or um, have brain injury. And not only was this a huge advance to childbirth and um, neonatal and maternal morbidity and mortality, this is actually the start of obstetrics as we know it. This is the first time that, well, one, that men entered into the, the um, practice of delivering babies, but that it became something that mattered and it became something that was studied and improved upon. And because of that, I'm in my job and it's good that they let women do it now too. Thank you very much.